Hi, welcome to Learn and Flutter. And in part two of Flutter Basics, we're going to be looking at stateless widgets. So what are stateless widgets? Before we get into stateless widgets or stateful widgets, let's talk about stateless versus stateful services. Now imagine that I have a user and I want them to access some service I have deployed in the internet. And maybe this is a simple server that just provides a listing. You know, user can request like, where are the numbers of books or, you know, file listing or something very simple like that. Just simply, hey, um, when they connect and they make a request, they get back a listing of a number of resources. And of course, since we're in the internet, we want to provide security. So I have a separate service that I also deploy that is going to be my authentication um, service. Now, before a user can access my listening service, they need to log in with my authentication service. So this would be sending their username, password, or whatever information is deemed um, necessary or for their credential, right? Send their credential to the authentication service. The authentication service will then go into its database and verify that this information is correct. The authentication service needs a database. Now, it doesn't matter if this database is external to the authentication service or it's part of the authentication service. That's implementation details. So once the authentication service now verify that the user information is correct, it might then update that database with some token that is going to associate with this for this user and this particular login um, session. And it might say, well, okay, here's I've generated a new token. And I have also said that how it can expire for an hour. And it's going to put that in the database. It needs to put it in the database because it needs to know when the user log in and when the token is valid or expired, right? And so it sends back to the user now this token. It says, okay, here's your token that represents your login session. The user now with this token can now connect to the um, listing service and say, hey, I like a listing. And by the way, here's my token. And so the list in it, it does not have access to this database where all this token is being stored or anything like that. So the only thing it can do is go to the auth service and say, hey, by the way, can you please verify this token that I got from a user and let me know if it's correct. And the auth service can say, well, yep, yeah, I'll check my database. It looks at it and it says, all right, um, yes, that is a valid token. And so now the auth service can return to the user with the response, right? They could fulfill their request. What is different about these two services? Now the listing service have all the information it needs to provide listing. The auth service have all the information it needs to be able to verify user login. But there's something very different. You see, let's say our listing service is so simple that as users make requests, it does not keep track of how many requests they serve or anything like that. So we can say that this listing service is stateless. It, it does not maintain any state. You can just simply restart it, bring up another one. It doesn't matter. They all will function the same way. And this sort of deployment um, architecture has some advantages because you can easily scale stateless services. You can create multiple of them, right? Um, not that you can't scale stateful services, like if you imagine we have our auth service, if we try to scale that and have two of them, now we have to say, well, do they share the same database? What kind of lock-in semantics do we have? If they're distributed, how do we reconcile differences in database? What set of records do we keep or user information we keep in one database versus the other? So these are other things that you have to think about. But when you come to your stateless service, the listing service, it's just multiple copies of that thing. And that's it. It has all the information when it comes up. Whatever it is, is serving like in terms of listing, it has that and that's it. It does not change anything. There are no changes that it register. Like when a user requests a listing, it can read that out of a database, but that's it. It just read that information, pre present it to the user, return it to the user. It does not update that listing itself, right? So it's a stateless service. The auth service on the other hand, make updates and changes. It knows when a token is valid, for how long it's valid. It um, you know, um, deletes token if they expire and all this other stuff. So that's a stateful service. Okay, so now that we un hopefully understand stateless versus stateful service, let's see how we can sort of apply 
um, that basic of base base of information to um, widgets. So in Flutter, they have the idea of stateless versus stateful widgets. And even though we're only going to be talking about stateless widgets in this video, we want to sort of understand um, the slight differences between them. So what are stateless widgets? Just like how our listing service know how to provide listing, well, a stateless widget would know, for example, how to draw themselves. It also have all the information that it needs for render. This is similar to our listing service, not only knowing how to do listing, but it has all the information, whether that's from an external database or wherever it has to go to get the information that it needs to um, fulfill that service. So stateless widgets, I want to be clear, they have information, okay, um, to fulfill the service or to help them render themselves properly and all this other thing, right? What they cannot do is update themselves based on changes. So this is similar to the stateless service where clients would connect and get requests, but it does not keep any information about, you know, how many clients have connected. And if the list and information change, well, it's changed externally and they do not react to that change in any way. Okay. Now, a stateless service is slightly different than a stateless wizard. You can just make a new request and the stateless service should give you that new information. But if once you create a stateless widget, if the information that is displaying change, it does not update. An example of this is if I create, like in our previous example, part one, we use a text box or a text widget rather to put some information on the screen. That's the information that we give it and say, here's some information. Now render yourself and show this text. If we change that variable that's all in that username or whatever text we had, the widget will not update because that's a stateless widget. And we're going to see a little bit more about that. But we also have stateful widget because if we could not build anything useful with just stateless widgets, just like we couldn't build too many usable services if everything was just stateless. We need something that maintains state, right? And so stateful widget can do everything like a stateless widget can do, which means it can render itself. It have all the information it needs for rendering and providing that service. But stateful widgets can update themselves if the information they have changes. So you can imagine that if we have a state full widget, then if it is displaying some text and that text represent the time, well, when it's four o'clock, it would show four o'clock. And a minute later, when the time changes to, you know, 401, then we want that widget to also update. And so in that case, we'd need to use a state full widget to implement the, the display for our clock. So if I had a statelet widget and I want to show information that's changing, I'll have to destroy it and recreate it. And that is more expensive than if I use a stateful widget that simply says, oh, only update the parts that have changed. Okay, so now that hopefully you have a little feel for that without yet knowing too much about widget, that just gives you a little idea of what we're going to be dealing with. So now let's jump back into the code. Okay, so here I am in my terminal. And we're looking at Flutter Basic Section 4, and we already did Part 1. Now, before we start with Part 2, I want to show you something. So let's go into this directory. I do ls. And if you do this, you might have a build folder. Now, since we're going to be copying these directories, and they can get pretty large, it makes sense for us to do a little bit of cleanup before we copy it. Cop do we do any copying? Because that helps us save on space. So for example, if I say this usage, and you can run, run this command if you're on a Mac or a Unix-like system, and say Mac, um, this usage, sorry, and space, for example, and it tells me um, basically the size, of how much bytes are being used by all those different things. And so I can say minus H for human readable. And so I can see that I have this Flutter, um, this iOS directory that's 140, and 14, 114 megabytes. Now I can say S for silent, which means I don't want it to go down nested and show me the subdirectories. So just stay at the top level. And so we can see my build directory is 162 megs. So if I make a copy right now of this part directory, we're talking about, you know, not quite 300, but definitely 270 megs, 280 megs 
directory that I'll be copying. So what I would like to do first is to say flutter clean and I want to see what I can get rid of. And as you can see, it's already Tomato is deleting the build directory. So if I do a du again, um, well, it didn't get to clean up the iOS directory, but that's okay. I need that. But the flutter clean command knows what it can get rid of that um, it will still allow you to rebuild your project and it recreate these things. So these are things that it creates in the process of building it called um, built artifacts, for example. All right, so that just help us. That's just a little um, tip to help us save on space. So I can run du minus sh and star, and so we can see that directory is about 114 megs instead of about 160 megs plus that, which would have been six, 280. All right, so now I can do a copy minus r of part one, and I want to call it part two. Okay. So I want to pick up exactly where we left off the last time. So I start my Visual Studio Code Editor there. All right. And so if you remember, for Flutter, we do all our coding in this main.dart file. And so I'll close this. And so this is what our example looked like the last time. So before we get started, though, let me just clean up a little bit because we don't need all this. So right now, what we have is this main function and we call this run app function. So main is the entry point for our application. We call run app, which we get from Flutter, where we import the material um, library. And then we call this build function. The build function returns a widget. It doesn't take anything, returns a widget. And what it does is it uses this variable and creates a new text widget, All right? It creates a text, a rich text widget and you know, we don't have to worry about all the details and basically it returns that widget or text widget as a child of a center widget. And that's because we want to be able to see it on the screen. Now let's do this. Let's say we have text widget one instead and we will make it this guy and let's remove this rich text widget. Again, we're simplifying things a bit. We know that uh, if we look at this text widget, we have the text that we need to display which is going to be derived from this variable. And then we need text direction. We need text direction because right now, all we are putting on the screen is this text widget. And we need to know where we do write the letters from left to right, top to bottom, right to left, whatever. And so we need to specify that. Overflow is optional. We don't need that. Um, and when it comes to style, again, we don't really need that. So. Um, right now, the only two things we need is the text to display and the direction that that text should run. And then we put that on the screen. So let's do this. Let's click here. We see no device. Let's start up our iOS simulator for me. I'm, that's where I'm going to start, but you can surely pick what makes sense for you. Um, and you have available. And we went through the setup and how to get that running. And so this is picking up from part one. So if you're you didn't do part one, then you certainly should not be starting here. You definitely go back to part one. Okay, so now we have our simulator running. And so I can run the program. I'm going to start the bug. And so this should um, compile and it's going to rebuild that, that build directory. As you can see, the build directory shows up again. And that's okay for the build directory to show up while I'm still working on things. It's just when I make a copy of an example, I'll always clean up and do the build directory. So even if you don't see me do it, you should do it if you want to save some space on your system. You might have a lot of hard drive space, but still makes sense to not be carrying around those things that um, you don't need all the time. All right, so no thanks for now. And so notice here's our um, app is running with that text in the middle of the screen. And that's because we did the center. Okay, so here's my question. What if we wanted to reuse this text? Let's say whatever this text represents, this widget that we're returning, what if we wanted to encapsulate the details, which is the direction that the text should flow, maybe the color and all this other stuff. We want to encapsulate that as our own widget that we can just reuse by passing in a limited number of parameters. So if we wanted to create our own widget, we might naturally think that uh, what we need to do is write a class, right? I mean, that makes sense. This widget is a class and text is also a class. So all these things are classes, right? And so let's call a class and we call it my text widget, for example. That's what the name I'll give it. 
And so that's my, this, I want to be a widget so I can use it the way that I'm using text as a widget. So I want to build upon the text widget and create my own widget. So it seemed to make sense that I, I would want this build function as part of my class. And so now I cannot pass, you know, build, call a build method, but instead I have to be able to say, I want you to use my text, create a text widget object, and then call the build method on that. So that still should work, right? And what we can do is we can say something like, hi, and then we can restart and we should see that it updates. So I haven't broken my application in any way, okay? Okay, so that, that seems fine. But this is, doesn't really help me very much. Yeah, sure, I can say that how oh, my text widget has a constructor, for example. Text widget has a constructor. And maybe I use this variable and move it into as a class, a field variable. And then now I can say, something like this that name is equals to name and name here will be a string so i can certainly do that and now instead of setting this variable here i can pass it in as a parameter to my object my class when i'm creating a new um my text object so the result is still the same like i can refresh and i haven't broken my application hopefully you believe me when i say that okay so this is all still working nice and good but of course this looks sort of weird when we use text we don't have to call no explicit build method to get it to build and so um, we can make things a little bit better i mean if you find yourself doing something like this in flutter in dart well you can just get rid of this and just simply do this like that and then now that simplifies your constructor. And then you can simplify it further since you have nothing else to do in here, you just use a semicolon. And so Dart allow you to do those nice simple thing and save you some coding, but the result again is still the same. We haven't done anything flutter crazy yet, right? This is all still Dart stuff. Okay, but why do I have to call this build method explicitly? What I'd ideally like to be able to do is simply say, I have a text widget, which it just looks like the other widget, you know, center and text. I want to be able to use it just like that. And so the reason why this is giving me an error is because as we know, my text widget is just a class, whereas this function accepts some, expects something that's a widget. So how do I create a widget? Well, this is just object-oriented programming. It seems to me that I have to extend a widget right that would certainly make my thing a widget and you can certainly do that but there's another type of widget that you can extend and it's a stateless widget and if you extend the stateless widget as you can see stateless widget itself extends widget so by extension <laughs> you this or my class is a widget and so we can go and read up on stateless widgets. It's a widget that does not require mutable state. And this is what we're talking about. It does not require mutable state. Not only does it require, it doesn't require it, it doesn't allow it. A stateless widget is a widget that describes part of the user interface by building a constellation of other widgets, yada, yada. We can sort of skip that whole thing, right? The building process continues recursively, and we're going to talk about that later in, later. But and you should definitely watch this video here. Click on this link to tell you how um, Flutter builds widget. But stateless widgets are useful when the part of the user interface you are describing does not depend on anything other than the configuration information in the object itself. This is exactly what we said in the presentation. We said a stateless widget have all the information it needs to put itself on the screen, render itself on the screen, draw itself on the screen, whatever you, however you want to say it. But it does not use any, if that information change, it doesn't react to it. And so that's when you want to use stateless widgets is when the part of your UI will not be changing. So for example, if I have a, you, my UI and I'm going to show who the current logged in user is, 
Well, that's not going to change for the um, while the users log into the application because they would have authenticated on another screen. I know who they are by tend to get to the main screen or some other screen that shows that information. And so I know exactly who they are. So I can use a text widget to put that information on the screen and I know it's not going to change while they're using the application. On the other hand, like I was saying, if I'm displaying the time, this is something that needs to be updated often. And so I have a couple ways of doing it. I can use a stateless widget, but I'll have to destroy it and recreate it. And I still have to have some way of saying, destroy this widget and recreate it with a new text value to represent the updated time. Or I can simply use a stateful widget, which helps me to deal with repainting or redrawing that widget if the information changes. And we're going to see stateful widget in part three. But this is just to keep driving home the idea about what the expectations are for state. Um, stateless widgets. And we could talk about other performance stuff or something, but you can certainly read some of, of that information. And so here's an example of how easy it is to implement a stateless widget. Of course, there's exactly what we have. We have class with our widget name, extend stateless widget. And all we have to do is override this function called build. Now notice how this build function is written compared to ours. Uh, let me go back here. This build function returns a widget, which ours does. It's called build, but then it takes something called a build context. Now, we're not going to worry about what build context really is at the moment, but you can imagine that there's some information about the environment in which this widget will be have to live. And so what it returns, it returns a widget because that's what it needs to do. It needs to construct and return a widget. So what we're missing here is build context. And that is why we have this error message. It's telling us that oh, this build function doesn't satisfy the requirement of, you know, this um, stateless, um, this stateless widget that we're trying to implement. So we have to put build context and we'll just call it context. And so now if, well, of course, since we we are overriding something, we should say, override um, just to indicate that oh this is a method that was being that's been overwritten that's um that was comp that we get from our parent okay and that's all there is to implement in a stateless widget we have fully implemented it we've simply added build context to our build method add the override keyword and stick this whole thing in a class that extends stateless widget and now above here there's no error because this is a widget and the run app knows that since we give it a widget in order to build it, it should call the build method with a context. So let's see if this was broken. So let's change this to hello world and then hi, and then let's refresh and we should see that, oh, there you go, it changed. I mean, it's very slight change. You can barely see it. So let me do this, take that out and Let's, there we go, it updated. Congrats, you've implemented your very first widget. Now, why would you want to implement your first widget? I hinted at it before, I actually said it, and I even hinted that you might want to be able to make some changes, build up and make a very complex widget. And I can, now, right now my widget only described like text direction, but I could have it include like, let's say, color or something like that and we'll do that in a bit and so i want users to be able to just reuse my carefully constructed widget over and over and over and make it easier for them to reuse and so now that i have it in a class i can cut this from here create a file for it a separate file so i'll create a directory called widgets for example or some people call it ui you know whatever you want it's just a directory and in this directory, I'll put my widget and I'll call it my text widget that dart. And I'll paste this in there. And of course, since I need to use stateless widget and all that good stuff, I need to import material library. Okay, so same thing, I import what I had before. And now that I have my widget in this file. I can send it and share it with others, but of course I need to import it here. And so I can say my underscore at that guy, uh, my underscore text 
well, I need to bring it in from that directory. Widgets is that my underscore text widget. And so now I import it and notice how I don't get an error message and my application crashed, but I can rerun it. It crashed because I moved things around and um, that was a little bit drastic. It couldn't find a definition for my text widget. And so wait a minute or a few seconds and we should get our application back and running again. So let's go back here and we can see it's coming back up. And there it is. Now, how do I know that oh, this widget can be reused multiple times? Well, if you're not convinced by me simply using it this way, one of the things we can do is we can say, well, let me wrap this widget in another widget because that's the thing with Flutter. It's just widgets within widgets within widgets or widgets all the way down. And so I can say wrap this in a column widget, for example. And the thing with a column widget is that it has children. Now a center widget only has a child, but a column widget has children. So multiple widgets. So you can see a list here, a list of widgets, which means I can do this. I can put multiple of these. John Doe. And we do Jane Doe. And I can refresh. So I should probably call this the high widget or something like this. But notice what happened. All our text is all the way back up to the top. So what happened? Well, we say center um, around the text, but now we're, we're putting these widgets within a column. And a column operates slightly differently. Well, so to understand it, let me just show you another property of the column widget. Now, right now we're using only one property. This is required, and that is the children property to um, specify the children of this column, how they should be laid out vertically. As you can see, a column creates a vertical array of children. So what are the other properties that we can change? This main access alignment actually is the one that I want to use. And so if we do main access alignment, and then we use the main access alignment class, we have some properties that we can use. And so one of these properties is n center and space around and all these other things. So I will start off by using end. Now, the reason I'm using end is because the default is start. And so if you think of it, aligning things from top to bottom, well, that's the start. And that's why all our things are pushed up to the top. And so if I say restart my application, notice all for n, it's stacked them down at the bottom, but they're still close together. I can try another property and I encourage you to try these. So for example, we can do space around and we save that and then reset and see what that looks like. And it means that I have three children and there's space around equal space around each one of them. So you can imagine whatever space is on the top of this is also on the bottom and is above here and it's below here and it's above here and below here. Hence why these guys look like they have so much space between them because they have equal space around them, top and bottom. Okay, at least on the top and the bottom, because we we're talking about the vertical, the main axis. So for a column, main axis of alignment is up and down, vertical, right? Because that's the main axis of a column. Whereas a row, the main axis of alignment for a row would be across, right? Horizontal, how things are placed horizontally. So let's try another one. So that's space around. And space between, how is space between different than space around? And so if we refresh, we'll see that our space between just simply push them far as far apart as possible so the space is not around them but only between them and so my very first child is somewhere behind this notch if your phone doesn't have a notch you would not have this problem and like i say eventually we will see how you can write application that automatically takes care of whether it has a notch or not flutter has way of doing that sort of thing for you so what is the next one available space evenly so we should expect that space evenly might look something like space or wrong, but of course evenly spaced out. And it does, right? This time, it doesn't have the same space above and below each widget, but rather just the space between them is evenly, is even. And so we have same space above here, 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 and below here. And finally, the one that we've been running away from 
is center. And so if we refresh now, we'll see that uh, they are bunched up in the middle again along that vertical axis. So that is the property we needed for our column. And notice how we're able to reuse our widget just like any other widget. Now, our widget just says hi to, to regards of what value we put in there. So for example, if we did something like Right. Today's a great day. It would say hi. Today is a is a great day, which is not exactly what we want. So while we can create our own widget, well, this is not the best way to create. So let's take this out and simply render whatever we pass in. That's what we want to do. And um, by the way, I'm not going to put a second period because I'll let the user decide how they want to specify their text. And so now we have that. And so there we go. Um, a little bit boring, but you know, maybe this is hi, well, now we can restart. And so we see our widgets that way. But what if we wanted to be able to um, add some color to a widget, right? There's a nice thing is that we can build up. So we did style before. So we can say, for example, we want our widget to be, no, there's this warning. I'll get back to this. Let's say we have, so this is a string, for example. And then since we use in our text that we got, so we can just simply do that. And we don't need actual, right. we don't need to enclose it in a string because it's already a string. So, um, so let's say we want to do color. So we say color, color, and this is going to be the color of or default color for my widget. Let's say like this, color, color, and then um, maybe I want to do this, that color is equals to color. Right, and um, that's the color that's passed in. And so um, now I have to construct my text box, my text widget with a color. So we know that is the style. So now we're using our color. And so what this means is that if we go back, so we can refresh and make sure that we didn't break anything. We can go back to main here and we can say, well, you know what? I like to use um, green here. So I can say color and I can do colors that green, for example. And that is one way in which I can specify that I want this text to be green. And for the other ones that I do not specify color, it uses the default color, but it's a little small. So maybe what I want is my, um, my style to also include bold. So let's do font weight. And so there we go. And do font weight and then bold. And so save that and notice how my all my text boxes are bold. So as you can see already, this ability to be able to build your own widgets and quickly apply changes to one and have it affect multiple widgets is how you build up your app, your Flutter application. And so I said, I will come back to revisit this idea. And so this warning, and so you see here, it says that oh, this class or a class with this class inherit from is marked as immutable. Immutable means that oh, it cannot be changed, but one or more of its instant fields are not final. Remember what we said, we said that stateless widgets do not react to changes um, in their properties, right? Like, so, whatever information they have, which is in this case is the name and color. Now, sure, that's passed in at the time it's constructed, but at once it's passed in, after then it cannot change. If you had something change in the value name after this widget is created, it will not update itself. What we should do is say that oh, this is final. And so that really drives home the fact that oh, these guys do not change after the fact. So they're going to be used to construct the widgets, but they cannot change after the fact. Now, once we make this final, of course, you know, we, we can do it this way, 
The only other way for us to set it is to really set it this way. So color equals color, something like that is one way we can do it. But why not just go and write something much simpler like this and get rid of this and then put back our semicolon. So very simple. So that's much more straightforward. And this is not Flutter what we're doing here with this. This is Dart the language. What we're saying is this first parameter is required and then this parameter is a name optional parameter. Okay, so I think that's enough. I don't want this to be too long. I wanna make it nice and simple for you to be able to just see how you can build these things up. Um, definitely play with it, you know, like write this example, add other properties, play around with the properties for the text box for do other things. Um, the font size and all these things you should do. Um, I show here color and, and weight, but certainly just keep going. And if you, you try something and it doesn't work, you can always do undo it, right? So if you go to font size and it's a double is the value, say, okay, let me try something. Let me try 16, right? And see what that looks like. And then you could see on my screen, it just changed, right? Um, 20. And um, we, we see that oh, we're using a column widget here, and we have main access alignment. Look at the other alignment, right? Or other properties and see what they do, just play around. And before I go, we can play the same game that we did earlier by simply saying, oh, I want to build this column widget with some children. And so why don't I just write a function called widget Call it build and it returns this column widget with this column widget with all its property, right? So why don't I do something like this? And then now I can just simply say um, call the build function, right? Um, one more parentheses that we need, but Notice, oh, I've simply just refactored my code by pulling the column, the, the creation of this column um, widget out and put it in its own function. And if we rerun re our application, it should still work. And um, we can test this by saying hello. And it should, if I save my file, it should update. But if it doesn't update, then I'll just refresh. And there you go. So our application is not broken, of course. I hope you're convinced by it now. But once I pull this out into a build function, what do we know about making a widget? We just simply say class, my colon text widget. You don't always have to include net widgets in the name. Extend stateless widget. There we go. And this particular widget, I don't need to, in this example, my, I don't need a constructor because I'm not doing anything. Um, but now you can start to see how you can you know, do this sort of thing. And now here we just simply say my column text widget. That's it. All right. And if I restart this, you can see that oh, um, it's rebuilt and it still works. So again, I'm going back and forth between hi and hello here to show you how um, it is working. Okay. And so you can now say, well, you know what? This column widget really takes. Uh, I want it to be a constructor that just takes a list of strings. And then internally, it, you know, um, instead of having these hard coded, it takes a list of strings and then it determines how many of these text widgets to, to create. Because now, once I can do that, now my column text widget can take any list, right, of strings. You try to make these some simple examples to so just try and illustrate the core concept and then you can build on the concept. Okay. All right. That's it. Take care. See you in the next video where we'll look at stateful widgets. Um, leave comments. If you haven't subscribed, please hit that subscribe button. Spread the word if you can. Um, see you in the next video.